Hey everybody, Professor Bob Long here doing your anatomy and physiology videos. Um, this video that I'm about to do should be, um, it's for my biology 2402 class, my AMP2 course. Um, and uh, it'll be over the heart. <clears throat> it should be, I think, heart lecture five. I don't know, it'll be in the, the number. The number will be in the title. Essentially what you need to know is this is um, a continuation of cardiodynamics and some things that affect cardiodynamics. The last lecture we did was cardiodynamics. So I'm gonna step back and review a little bit of that. Um, before I get too far, just a quick note. Some of y'all are probably tired of hearing this uh, with each video, but um, these are very quick impromptu videos with some minuscule equipment um, or minimum of equipment uh, under duress because of the coronavirus or COVID-19 outbreak. We're not allowed to meet face to face. So I'm trying to get all my videos online. I'm trying to use the classroom at the college because of uh, the amount of board space. I've done some videos at home and it's much smaller. And some of the lectures, I need a lot more space. And they are closing the campus down and denying us access um, after today. So I've been trying to, to get as many of these lectures done as rapidly as possible. So please bear with me. Um, again, these are all one take impromptu videos. So um, bear with me. If you're in my class and you're in part 2 AMP, you can follow along in the notes set on page 55. If you're not in my class, well, I hope you learned something. I hope you have some fun. So we were talking about cardiodynamics last time. <clears throat> also, by the way, I have, uh, I've had some severe allergies. Uh, my mesquite tree in my front yard is trying to mate with me. Um, so uh, forgive me. It's causing me to have a little bit of sinus congestion and a little bit of cough. So, and the more I talk, the more it roughs up my respiratory tract. I do not have the virus. I've already had my temperature taken. I don't have any secondary symptoms. I'm fine. Um, I'm just having some allergies. <coughs> now, excuse me. <clears throat> so, we were talking about cardiodynamics, and the central tenet is that cardiac output, and I've already, all the abbreviations I'm using were in the previous video. CO is cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times the heart rate. And we went over some basics here, and I'll review this really quickly. Um, so, if I mess with stroke, uh, stroke volume or heart rate, it will change how much blood my heart is putting out. And cardiodynamics is the ability of the heart to change the cardiac output, how much blood it's ejecting, therefore, much, how much oxygen, therefore how much oxygen and glucose it's delivering to my muscles, my brain, the heart itself, and the lungs. We have to increase blood flow to the lungs because we have to get rid of the excess carbon dioxide under sympathetic stimulation from muscles generating more carbon dioxide and more contractions. And I have to increase the oxygen flow because they're burning up all their ATP. If we were running from a, 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 I don't know, a pit bull or something, you want to be able to outrun or at least outlast that dog. <clears throat> I've got to increase heart, uh, blood flow to the heart because the heart itself is a muscle and it's going to be working faster and harder as well as it's going to be pumping the blood to my other systems. I need to increase blood flow to the muscles for performance, brain for thinking my way out of a difficult situation. I don't need a lot of blood flow down here, so I will constrict blood vessels, but the cardiodynamics is the, my body's ability to meet my energy demands. Now, if I go to parasympathetic stimulation, my digestive tract and my other um, systems, urinary and reproductive systems, they don't burn a lot of energy, so the heart can slow down Breathing rate can slow, and y'all know the effects of sympathetic and parasympathetic at this point. So now, a couple of things I know. Cardiac output is proportional to stroke volume. And what we said before is, if stroke volume increases, cardiac output increases. And if stroke volume decreases, cardiac output decreases. Rather simple. Cardiac output is proportional to heart rate. So what that means is, if heart rate increases, cardiac output increases and vice versa. If heart rate decreases, cardiac output decreases. We covered those two, right? <clears throat> and then we also talked about end diastolic volume and end systolic volume. Since stroke volume is equal to the end diastolic volume plus the end, I'm sorry, minus the end systolic volume, then I know that cardiac output is proportional to end diastolic volume. What that means is if end diastolic volume increases, cardiac output increases simply because the stroke volume increases. So they're all kind of the same thing. And if end diastolic volume decreases, cardiac output will decrease because stroke volume decreases. This is all a review of what we did last time. 
The only one that's different is end systolic volume. Cardiac output has an inverse relationship with end systolic volume. Anytime I have uh, this setup where one of them is in a fraction state, that means if this one goes up, this one goes down. One over 10 is 1 tenth. One over 100 would be 1 one hundredth. So the larger the, this number, the smaller this one will be. So what that means is if end systolic volume increases, cardiac output decreases because stroke volume decreases. I have more blood left in the heart at the end of systole and vice versa. If end systolic volume decreases, then cardiac output will increase because stroke volume increases. This is the only one you need to know that has the opposite effect. So there are four things we're comparing. Cardiac output to stroke volume, cardiac output to heart rate, cardiac output to end diastolic volume. They are all proportional or direct relationships. If one goes up, the other one goes up. The only one that is an inverse relationship is end systolic volume. If end systolic volume goes up, cardiac output goes down. Now, we're gonna look at some factors that affect all of this stuff. So I'm gonna erase these equations. We've done them in a previous video, but I do like to reiterate them because I want you guys to pay attention because I am gonna ask some questions like what happens to cardiac output if end diastolic volume increases? Or I could ask a question like, which of the following situations would increase cardiac output and give you some of those increased stroke volume increase heart rate, decrease stroke volume, increase in systolic volume, and you have to pick them out. So, now, <clears throat> what are some of the things that affect this? This is what we start on on page 56, factors that are affecting heart rate. I'm sorry, um, I'm trying to video with my phone and my computer. The computer is very dark, you can't see very well. The phone has very good picture, but the phone has a smaller screen, so sometimes if I step forward, it cuts my head off. Just bear with me, y'all don't really wanna see me anyway. Um, although some people requested to have more of me in the video, why I don't know, but whatever. So now, <clears throat> there are a few things that can increase our heart rate and or our stroke volume. One of them is the autonomic innervation. So when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, you guys need to know that autonomic um, innervation or an autonomic stimulation simply means this, sympathetic, and parasympathetic. And just in case you don't know this, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems go by some alternate names. I'm gonna draw a quick picture here and then we'll come back to it. So if this is your brain, then if I could divide it into three regions, sort of the cranial region, thoracolumbar, coming from the thorax to the lumbar region and the sacral region. So I have different regions of the spinal cord, right? Or the nervous system. Well, I look at it this way. Thoracolumbar is where all the sympathetic nerves come off of the spinal cord. That's why the sympathetic nervous system is sometimes called the thoracolumbar nervous system. All of those neurons that are going to go to parts of our body and have sympathetic stimulation come from the thoracolumbar part. The cranial and the sacral region are the parasympathetic areas. All those nerves that have the parasympathetic activation actually exit the spinal cord from, or exit the, the central nervous system through the brain, the upper part of the spinal cord, and in the sacral region. Hence, craniosacral is the name of the parasympathetic and thoracolumbar is part of the sympathetic nervous system. Just a quick review. So now, <clears throat> under sympathetic stimulation, fight or flight, <coughs> because I'm going to be going 90 miles an hour. And there's some simple ways to think of this. Many of y'all have heard this if you've been in my class, but I'm going to repeat it real quick. I always think of, the, of a choo-choo train, the old steam engines from the Old West. So the way these steam engines work is they use steam to power pistons. There was a big boiler tank with a fire underneath it that boiled water. As we boil water, it generates steam, and as you know, steam rises. Connected to this big tank were some big metal tubes that had holes in them near the top. And there's a big metal rod that blocks it off, or a cylinder, and as the steam rises, it pushes the cylinder. If I have two of these cylinders, then when one's way up high, 
The other one's kind of down low. And eventually those things are pushing on the wheels like your feet on the pedals of a bike. So steam engines work this way. And as we generate steam, one piston will go up. When it passes the opening, all the steam is released and you'll hear that shh sound. And as that piston drops, the other one's rising and then you'll hear the shh sound. And those old trains would do that. Hence the term choo-choo. I know I look like a goofball doing this, but I don't really care. So the way that the train moved faster was by increasing the fire, which increased the rate of generation of steam, the faster the wheels went. Now, one guy driving the train was the engineer. He did the timing and all the braking and how long we need to do this. The other guy was the fireman. And the fireman literally stood here with a shovel and a thing called a bellows. I don't know if you know what the bellows is, but they look like an accordion, but it's that, um, I don't know, it's a thing that you see by people's fireplaces that blows air on a fire. Because a fire needs two things to burn. It needs a carbon source and it needs oxygen. And if you notice on these old trains, the car right behind it was a coal car. Well, this is how I think of this. The fireman, the one shoveling the coal and blowing the oxygen on the engine really is your heart. And your lungs are really the bellows, getting the oxygen in and the carbon dioxide out. Now, the coal car is going to be liver and skeletal muscle. And the coal is glycogen, which is how glucose is stored in larger molecules called glycogen. We've covered some of this in part one. We'll do it in more detail later on in part two. We're about to get there. So when I break down glycogen in liver and muscle, I'm going to release glucose molecules. My heart is going to shovel glucose, a carbon source, and oxygen, an oxygen source, into the fire. So now, the train represents brain and skeletal muscle. If I'm under sympathetic stimulation, my brain and my skeletal muscle better start firing rapidly. Because if something jumps out and starts chasing me that threatens my life, I have to decide, am I going to fight for my life? And then what is the best way to attack this thing or defend myself? Are there any weapons around? I need to start thinking and seeing and acting rapidly. Or I better run for my life and I better start thinking, where are the exits? Do I jump on a car if a dog is chasing me? Do I climb a tree? What do I do? So I need increased activity here. So <clears throat> under sympathetic stimulation, these are going to increase. If I'm going to increase the activity of brain and skeletal muscle, which burn way more energy than any other tissues in the body, lots of ATP, then I better start flowing a lot of oxygen and glucose to them to replace the ATP that I'm burning so my train can keep going. It's a simple concept, but it works. So I know under sympathetic stimulation, I get increased brain and skeletal muscle activity, then I'm going to get increased heart rate, increased breathing rate, and I'm going to release glycogen or glucose from the glycogen stores in the body to keep me going until I get to a safe space. Once everything's safe, I can switch to parasympathetic. Under parasympathetic, it's supposed to be an S, I'm going to decrease brain and skeletal muscle activity. Everything's calm and cool and chill. I can relax. I can shut down my heart rate and my breathing rate and all of this. Now I can step off the train and grab a meal go use the restroom, rent a room and crash for the night or whatever it is that I need to do. Fight or flight, rest and digest. So that gives us a, a kind of a, a simple scenario to remember what's going on. And I think of it in these terms, although it's not quite 100% accurate. Above the diaphragm, everything increases. Skeletal muscle, although my legs do have muscle, but skeletal muscle, heart, lungs, and brain, sympathetic. Under parasympathetic, Everything below the diaphragm is going to ramp up, and all this other stuff shuts down. They're opposites. If one goes up, the other goes down. If I'm increasing skeletal muscle and brain activity, then digestion and uh, waste and reproductive functions all go down. If I flip them, parasympathetic, I will decrease brain and skeletal muscle activity. I will increase digestive waste, reproductive urinary function, all of that stuff below the diaphragm, the viscera. Now, <clears throat> knowing that, I'm going to erase all this because sympathetic and parasympathetic have an effect on heart. So 
Under sympathetic stimulation, we know that the neurotransmitter or the hormone that can be released on the heart, because it functions both as a hormone and a neurotransmitter, is norepinephrine. I'm just going to put norepi, or we abbreviate it as any, but norepinephrine is another name for adrenaline. And it has a cousin called epinephrine. Norepinephrine and epinephrine have similar effects. One of the things we know is that they're going to increase heart rate. But what they do is they increase permeability of nodal cells to sodium ions. They increase permeability to sodium ions. So if you think about this, if I'm looking at the cell membrane of a cardiocyte, I'm already going to have leaky sodium channels that allow sodium to diffuse in, causing it to go and reach threshold and fire an action potential. And when we look at the cardiocyte action potential, we see that we slowly drift to threshold, we fire the action potential, we sustain the contractions, we slowly drift to threshold, and we do that at about 75 times a minute. And this is what's happening here, is that drift to threshold. I do have voltage-gated sodium channels, but in addition to that, I do have chemically-gated sodium channels. If adrenaline opens the chemically-gated sodium channels, then when I dump adrenaline on the heart, every time I bind norepinephrine to one of these, now sodium is going to rush into the cell faster. That's going to increase the rate at which I reach my threshold. That's going to cause the cell to fire, contract, fire, contract, and I can increase the number of contractions by drifting the threshold much faster than I normally would. That's one effect that adrenaline has on the heart. Now, another effect is that it can increase permeability to calcium ions. As you guys know, calcium will cause the force of contraction and sustain the contraction. So, one of the things that happens is by increase the amount of sodium rushing into the cell, sorry this is so messy, I'm going to increase heart rate, which therefore would increase cardiac output. The increasing permeability to calcium will increase the force of contraction of the heart, which will increase stroke volume. So under sympathetic stimulation, I'm going to not only increase heart rate, I'm going to increase stroke volume and skyrocket my cardiac output while I'm trying to run or fight for my life. Parasympathetic has a different effect. Under parasympathetic, the neurotransmitter, and I'm going to abbreviate neurotransmitter as NT, is acetylcholine, which we abbreviated in part one as capital A, capital C, lowercase h. Acetylcholine is excitatory on skeletal muscle. It actually opens sodium channels. But on cardiac muscle, it's inhibitory. It opens potassium channels. And as you know, or you should know, that potassium ions are in a much higher concentration outside, I'm sorry, inside the cell than out. If I open the potassium channels, so let's say I put this all back at rest, but here's a potassium channel. If I open it, potassium leaks out of the cell, essentially losing positive charge. So when I open potassium channels, I'm actually going to slow the rate of depolarization, and then the heart will contract. It will actually slow the rate of repolarization because potassium is exiting the cell less slowly, <clears throat> and therefore it takes longer for the heart to reach threshold and to relax. So it actually slows our heart rate. And because potassium is counterbalancing cal calcium, it can have an effect on stroke volume, but it's much less pronounced. So sympathetic stimulation, since adrenaline is both a neurotransmitter released by neurons or a hormone dumped into our system by the adrenal gland, the adrenal medulla, it increases cardiac output by increasing heart rate and stroke volume. It opens sodium ion channels and calcium ion channels, increasing the rate and the intensity of the contraction. Parasympathetic, the neurotransmitter, 
that is released on the nodal cells is acetylcholine. It opens potassium channels, therefore somewhat hyperpolarizing the cell, making it take longer to, to beat and slows your heart rate. For people in emergency medicine, a lot of times in the drug kits, you carry adrenaline and acetylcholine and you administer these. If someone is tachycardic, tachycardia is a rapid heart rate. If someone's heart is beating so fast, there's no filling time. It can't have a good cardiac output. And so you would administer acetylcholine and it can slow the heart. Now, if you get your medical dosage calculation incorrectly, you could stop the heart from contracting and kill somebody. That's why being good at math is gonna be important if you're gonna do anything in healthcare. Now, if the heart is not beating very well or at all, if you drip adrenaline on the nodes, it will cause the heart to start up sometimes and start beating. Again, if you overdose someone on it, you can cause a heart attack. So you have to get your medical dosage calculations right. So anyway, those are the two hormones. Now, and that's autonomic innervation. Our brain, by the way, let me erase some of this and show you something. Our brain has some sensors called the cardioacceleratory and the cardioinhibitory sensors, and they live down lower in the brain. If you remember from part one when we studied the brain, the higher up in the brain I go, the higher order thinking. The lower down in the brain I go, including the brain stem, is where I have the most basic vital functions, the things that just keep me alive, and then this gets all crazy with art and music and all that other stuff. But down here, near the medulla and the pons, and the medulla particularly, um, there's an area that controls heart rate. The cardioacceleratory center is a center, it's a group of neurons, acceleratory, acceleratory center, will increase heart rate. Those neurons that come out of the cardioacceleratory center go and eventually synapse on the heart and they will release adrenaline and increase heart rate and force of contraction. The cardio inhibitory center, which is located very close to this one, will decrease heart rate and force of contraction. And neurons from the cardio inhibitory center will come down and release acetylcholine on the heart and slow it. So our brain can affect heart rate. Um, another thing that can affect cardiac output, and there's a bunch of these, so you just have to stick with me here. On page 56 of your notes set <clears throat> is, um, and I'm, I'm only referring to my notes so that I can stay on pace and keep you all in order, is what we call the atrial reflex or the Bainbridge reflex, um, also called the Frank Starling principle. <clears throat> Essentially, it's this. So if I look at the atria and the ventricles with the interatrial septum, the, the valves, and the interventricular septum, if I look at the atria and the ventricles, as the vena cavi are returning blood back to the heart, as blood is coming into the heart, blood is being ejected from the two um, ventricles this way at about the same rate. Now, one of the things that happens is deep in our legs, our veins have little valves in them, little, they're valves, they prevent the backward flow of blood. So let's say I'm looking down in someone's leg. Gravity is trying to force the blood backwards sometimes in veins since they're under such low pressure. And so that the blood does not flow backwards, it gets caught in these little areas that can cause the veins to bulge out a little bit by what are called venous valves. Now that stored blood in these venous valves can lead to varicose veins, by the way. But nonetheless, when the muscles surrounding that. So let's say I start exercising or walking. As the muscles contract, they will squeeze. As they squeeze this chamber, there's only one direction the blood can flow, and it's this way. The valves will only open in one direction, and that will increase blood to the heart. It's called an increased venous return. Now, if the heart is pumping blood out at one rate, but I'm feeding blood into it faster than it can pump it out, then what's going to happen is I'm going to see that the chambers of the heart start to expand a little bit more. Eventually, 
the heart will max out, and that's what the uh, auricles are for. They're the overflow pouches. But until the heart rate can increase, we actually increase venous return when we first start exercising. Most people, when they get on an elliptical and start exercising, their heart rate doesn't go up until a few seconds or minutes after they begin exercising. So that's because the venous return will increase as we start contracting the muscles and the carbon dioxide generation from muscle contractions, and then the heart speeds up to get rid of the carbon dioxide and increase the uh, output. Essentially, the atrial reflex is this, and it's, it's really kind of two things. There's one that's called preload. In preload, preload is an increased stretching in the walls of the chambers. Remember there, the fibrous skeleton of the heart has some elastic fibers to it, so if I stretch a little bit more, just like a balloon, it's gonna snap back a little bit harder and eject a little bit more blood. Increased venous return means increased cardiac output. And part of it is due, well, I didn't even spell the word stretching right. Um, part of that is due to what we call preload. I stretch a little bit more, therefore the walls will snap back and eject that extra blood. And essentially the idea is more in equals more out. That's really the Frank Starling principle or the Bainbridge reflex or the atrial reflex. But part of the atrial reflex also is this. There are baroreceptors in the walls of the atrium. And as the right atrium starts to stretch, those baroreceptors feed back to that cardioacceleratory center Man, I'm not writing very well today, I apologize. But the cardioacceleratory center will reflexively fire back on the SA node and increase heart rate and force of contraction till it all balances out. So, <clears throat> the two things affect, affecting the increased venous return are affected by increased venous return are the preload, the extra stretch will squeeze a little bit of blood out, but also if it increases over a period of time, the heart feeds back to the cardioacceleratory center. We release adrenaline on the nodes and the heart starts beating harder and faster, getting the extra blood out. That's why your heart rate goes up after you start exercising usually, not before, okay? Um, a couple of other hormones, and by the way, I didn't cover this uh, in the previous drawing, but we know adrenaline increases heart rate and um, uh, stroke volume. But there are two other hormones that have similar effects to uh, adrenaline. One is the thyroid hormone. Since the thyroid hormone, excuse me, is going to increase metabolism, the rate at which I'm burning oxygen and glucose to make ATP, I need to start feeding that oxygen to my tissues faster. So thyroid hormone, excuse me, will reflexively increase heart rate. Cortisone, the adrenal corticoids, and hydrocortisone, its cousin, but cortisone can also increase heart rate. Since cortisone is released under extreme starvation or very low blood sugar levels, since we're going to be releasing um, the glycogen as glucose, remember glycogenolysis and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, well in glycogenolysis when we break down the glycogen and release the glucose, I still got to deliver the glucose to the cells and so therefore cortisone can also increase heart rate. Increased cardiac output to meet our energy demands must be really important because I have at least three hormones now that are affecting it. Adrenaline, cortisone, thyroid hormone. We also have erythropoietin for increased red blood cell production if, we're if we have decreased oxygen, but I'm not going to go down that. We've already done those. Finally, two other hormones can affect um, our heart, but they really affect blood pressure. If you remember, we had the hormone um, uh, aldosterone which I always refer to as salty aldosterone or salty aldo. Aldosterone is a mineral corticoid. The effects of aldosterone is that they will increase sodium and chloride ion loss in urine. Aldosterone works on salt. Water follows the salt. It will decrease blood volume and blood pressure, therefore lowering blood pressure if our blood pressure is elevated, right?
No, I didn't. That's the exact opposite. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the hormone that I'm going to. I'm not going to redo this video, so bear with me. This is the effects of a hormone called atrial natriuretic peptide, or some books now call it atrial natriuretic hormone. Atrial comes from the right atrium. Natrium is the name of sodium, and uretic means to pee. So this is going to increase your peeing of salt. I increase sodium and chloride loss in urine. Water follows the salt. That's gonna lower my blood volume and my blood pressure so that <clears throat> I can get back to homeostasis. That's the exact opposite of what we studied with salty aldo. If I look at salty aldosterone from part one, I mean, from a previous lecture test, Remember, aldosterone will increase blood pressure if it's too low. And what aldosterone does is it will decrease sodium and chloride ion loss in urine. Or some books will say that it increases our um, retention of sodium. We keep the sodium and chloride. So as we reuptake the sodium chloride, water follows the salt. This will increase blood volume and blood pressure. We've done aldosterone before when we did hormones. Atrial natriuretic peptide is the antagonist to aldosterone. Aldosterone raises blood pressure, A and P lowers blood pressure, and they both work on salt. They work, both work on natrium or sodium ions, okay? Um, your electrolyte balance will also affect cardiac output and heart function. So I'm gonna erase all of this. <clears throat> you can see increase venous return increases cardiac output and increase A and P will lower blood pressure. Increase aldosterone will raise blood pressure. By the way, there are a number of drugs that mimic the effects of A and P that lower blood pressure, blood pressure medications. And those people who take them, the side effects are they crave salt and they pee a lot. They chug water like crazy and eat salt and they keep peeing and that's that principle. Anyway, <coughs> excuse me, I apologize for all the coughing. <clears throat> I just can't help it, my voice and my throat are getting roughed up from my allergies. Um, so, electrolytes. Electrolytes are anything that have an electrical charge. Electrolytes literally means ions. Electrolytes include sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium, and many other ions. But these are the major players for us right now because we see the effects of sodium, potassium, and calcium on heart contractility, heart rate, stroke volume, and all of that. So now, think about this. Here's a typical cell. I have a higher concentration of sodium outside the cell than I do have sodium inside the cell. And if I have sodium channels that open or close, gated channels or even voltage channels, I mean uh, leak channels, sodium is gonna leak in and add positive charge. And I have a certain, here, let me draw it on this side. I have a certain, from outside to inside the cell, I have a much higher concentration of sodium. Sodium wants to diffuse in. If I continue to eat way too much salt, and I raise the external sodium concentration, I can see that the gradient or slope becomes greater and I will increase the rate of diffusion of sodium into the cell, increasing the rate of depolarization. If I lower the concentration of sodium in the cell, say to this point, then sodium will leak in more slowly and I will depolarize more slowly. So sodium balance is important. Now, <clears throat> We have a lot of systems that balance out sodium, so it has much less effect. If I were to go to potassium, and I'm gonna do potassium in blue here, okay? So if I were to go to potassium, the concentration of potassium is much higher inside the cell than is the concentration of potassium outside the cell. And so my concentration gradient from inside to out will be like this. It's actually much steeper than sodium. But if I increase the extracellular potassium, outside and inside, intracellular, extracellular. If I were to raise the amount of extracellular potassium, if I eat a whole tree worth of bananas, and I got all this excess potassium out here, 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to affect the rate at which potassium will leak out of my cell. It will leak out of the cell more slowly. That would actually slow repolarization, which would slow my heart rate. If I increase the, or decrease the potassium concentration in my body, let's say I lower it to here. Now look at the slope. Potassium is gonna leak out of the cell much faster. If it leaks out of the cell more faster, then what's essentially going to happen on my cardio side action potential is it's gonna take longer to reach threshold. So hyperkalemia, this word hyper meaning more than, Kalemia, this is where we get the K for potassium. The word kalemia means potassium in Latin. So hyperkalemia means an increased potassium ion concentration will slow heart rate because it slows repolarization of the cells, taking longer to depolarize the next time. Oddly enough, hypokalemia, which is a low potassium rate, is going to have the same effect, but it slows repolarization. I mean, sorry, it's, it slows depolarization. Hyperkalemia slows repolarization. Hypokalemia slows depolarization, and both will slow heart rate. And then the next one <clears throat> is calcium. So I'm going to erase all this. I'm going to erase all my ions. I'm just going to erase the cell and redraw it. <clears throat> if you recall, the free calcium ion concentration is much higher outside the cell than it is inside. And when we do the cardiocyte action potential, it's the plateau phase that is dependent upon calcium and potassium, correct? So, now, if I get into what's called hypercalcemia, the emia is blood, like heme, calcium is high, so I have a high blood calcium level. I got too much calcium, so from Outside to inside, my calcium concentrations are like this. If I increase the calcium concentration outside the cell, calcium will rush into the cell a little more rapidly. <clears throat> if I decrease the calcium concentration, calcium rushes into the cell a little less rapidly. <coughs> Excuse me. And so um, if I increase the length by having calcium hang around longer, if I increase the plateau phase, it can slow my heart rate, eventually possibly slowing or stopping the heart, and it can kill you. Under hypocalcemia, um, what happens is I'm not going to get a lot of contraction out of the heart. I'm not going to get a lot of cardiac output, and the heart rate can become very weak, and it can stop the heart as well. So you need to know the difference between hyper and hypokalemia and hyper and hypocalcemia. They're in the note set, you can look them up. You can also look up the definitions of bradycardia and tachycardia. Tachycardia is a rapid heart rate, too fast. Bradycardia is a low or slow heart rate. And these electrolytes have a major effect on that. If you're following along in my notes, um, we've already talked about end diastolic volume and end systolic volume. Um, and we've talked about just about almost everything that we can talk about that affects cardiac output except for one other concept. So let me erase all this and let me talk about it.